This factory sounds like a coin-operated arcade. And all of these massive buildings filled with massive machines make this. A bearing. We've seen how computer fans get made in the past. But we've never seen how the parts of those fans are made. This highly specialized factory makes a part that's commonly faked in case fan marketing. High-end fluid dynamic bearings. They wanted to show us how the real ones are made, since so many companies claim to use FDBs, but when you tear the fans apart, they just use sleeve bearings. This factory makes millions of FDBs and ball bearings per year, and they're a major supplier for quality bearings and computer case fans. We went all the way up the supply chain this time for this special look behind the scenes of how parts are made. This Taiwan-based factory makes fluid dynamic bearings for Lian Li's most expensive case fan. The factory is owned by TPI Bearings, which makes not only fan bearings, but also angular contact ball bearings for machine tools, deep groove ball bearings for general use, fluid dynamic bearings for servos and robotic arms, TD strain wave drives and joints, and even bearings for gigantic construction machinery. In fact, the largest bearing in this lobby was the size of an entire case fan about 120 millimeters. In this special addition to our latest factory tour season, we'll see how ball bearings and fluid dynamic bearings get cleaned of debris and greased for use, and how they're optically scanned and carried away on automated conveyor belts. We'll show how they're ground and prepped, and we'll get an educational opportunity to learn about the differences between these two types of bearings. The last part of the tour will focus on FDBs specifically, which are one of the most expensive parts for PC case fans. Let's get started with this educational deep dive into case fan bearings. This is the factory. It's aisles upon aisles of equipment with conveyor belts running all the way up to the ceiling and around the facility. We'll start with the life cycle of an angular contact ball bearing. First, an explainer. Angular contact ball bearings, or commonly shortened to just ball bearings, typically use steel balls, ceramic balls, or a mix of carbon and chromium to roll between an inner and outer raceway, or rings. High precision rolling elements need to be manufactured to find tolerances to ensure precision and stability of rotation, especially at high speeds and heat, and the bearing has to be packed with grease to encourage low friction rotation. There are many types of grease for use in different applications, ranging from high heat automotive to relatively low heat spindles. The inner race has a groove, or sometimes a special deep groove, in which the balls roll. A cage or a retainer is used to separate the balls and keep rotation smooth. The cage has a big impact on noise emissions as well. To prevent lubricant from leaking, most ball bearings also use shields or seals of rubber, and they also double as protection against contaminants. Ball bearings typically develop fatigue within the raceway or rolling element with age. Commonly, the rated L10 lifespan, or the minimum lifespan of 90% of the bearings, is 50,000 hours. Depends on the application. Common pros of a ball bearing include cost efficacy, versatility, and strength in high-speed applications. They're also low maintenance with shielding, and relatively easy to maintain when necessary. Common cons are limited load capacity, where the rolling element can deform under weight, noise levels at high speed and particularly when the grease dries, heat at speed, and sensitivity to contaminants. Now that we have some basics, let's go to the factory. We're starting with the ball bearing part of the factory. Each angular contact ball bearing line is manned by just one person. And is capable of producing 100,000 complete ball bearing assemblies per month. The factory is equipped with multiple of these lines spanning several floors. The line starts with an exciting bright red beam that looks almost molten. This optical inspection machine is the first step in the process. It gets fed from a hopper that contains a supply of inner and outer rings, or raceways. They're not assembled yet. This automated process carefully scans for diameter, done by using an arm that shoots down to hold the component in place while a laser scanner analyzes the size. Tolerance can be tuned for the customer 
but these bearings are inspected to a tolerance of 30 microns. Any defects are sorted aside for manual inspection to see if they're salvageable, and if not, the metal is sold to metal recyclers. The defect rate of step one in this process is one in 1,000 units, or 0.1%. As bearings pass, they're pushed with a robotic arm onto the oil-covered slipway that brings them to a mechanical counter, which simply ticks up for each new part. And then they progress down the slide into a tiny lift for bearings. This goes up to a track that leads to the second stop in this line, the grinding machine. Looking at the grinding machine in action through this protective glass, it does exactly what the name suggests. The machine grinds down the rings to begin smoothing them out for their future low friction application. This process takes 10 seconds for each of the smaller products and 30 to 40 for the larger one. One unique challenge of the grinding process is that it magnetizes the parts, so the components run through a demagnetizer before proceeding. Like clockwork, each ring follows these steps, dumping oil with each one spit out. The oil gets recaptured in a pan under the machine, filtered, and then reused later. The apex of the line runs through an oil bath, which helps rid the race of any debris from the grinding process and then relubricates it. Then, just like before, they progress over to another vertical lift and travel up and over to the next machine. That's where we get to the most important part of this process, polishing. The polishing process follows the grinding and oil bath, getting a perfect finish to the surface. After polishing, some bearings are spot checked at a manual inspection station. This involves tools like a magnifying glass and measurement gauges or calipers to measure the surface smoothness, the diameter, and the finish. And as they progress once again, the bearings end up back in the lift and they're brought up to the ceiling, over to the next room, through another 10 seconds oil bath in a box, and then to the ultrasonic cleaner. Here, the smaller rings are held in place for about 8 seconds at a time and then advanced on the track, while the larger ones take longer. These ultrasonic cleaners use cavitation bubbles from high-frequency sound waves to help dislodge debris and dust. When the bubbles pop, debris is removed and swept away by oil. TPI says that dust is the number one cause of failure for bearings, which is why they have so many cleaning steps at every stage in the pipeline. Oil is regularly changed at this stage, and it's sent through filters like these, which help trap contaminants at multiple filtering stages to reduce the use of new oil. In the background of the ultrasonic cleaner and the filter, you can already see the next machine working, and it's completely custom built for this job. This machine is one of the most mechanically active. Its job is to match the most suitable inner and outer race to each other. Due to the 30 micron tolerances previously, the over-under of the inner and outer reins means that they can't just be combined at random to have a high quality ball bearing. Instead, as each rein enters the machine fresh from the ultrasonic cleaner, a robotic arm moves in, extends down, and expands a physical gauge acting as calipers to measure the inner and outer diameters. Then, the central robotic arm picks up the ring and either places it in the middle, acting as a holding area until a perfect match is found, or places it to the side nearest the exit, and that's with its match. Like a matchmaker, the arm creates a memory and knows the tolerance of each individual ring it picks up. It then tracks its location and memory until the perfect match is discovered. This reduces defects, eliminates guesswork, and increases precision. For the parts being made today, the inner to outer range of mating tolerance is 13 to 29 microns, so they have a 16 micron gap within that original plus or minus 30. Imagine getting swiped left on because you were 31 microns the wrong height. It's a very judgmental robot. If any bad raceways are found at this stage, they're set aside in a different holding area to be reclaimed or recycled. The paired inner and outer rings next exit the machine and have the steel balls placed roughly between them. However, the balls can't fit within the inner and outer ring yet due to the tolerances, so they sit only partially lowered into their final location with the seal applied. The unit progresses to a heating coil, where it heats all the components up enough to loosen and expand the rings, which allows the rolling elements to fall into place within the complete ball bearing unit. The bearing only needs to sit within the coil for four to five seconds as it gets blasted with heat, making this one of the most efficient parts of the process. Watching this machine work is impressive.
And now for the final steps of the ball bearing manufacturing process, starting with photography. Here, the assembled angular contact bearing proceeds to a dark chamber for some quick flash photography. This serves as another optical inspection step where the machine is checking the photo for accurate placement of all components. It also saves the image and presents it on the screen for human quality control operators to inspect. As the bearings exit, a series of pistons work to punch the bearings over to the correct track, depending on whether it passed or failed AOI, and then they get cued and punched into the next conveyor belt. Failure rate for completed units at this stage is under 0.1%, and the factory was able to achieve this by building its matchmaking robot that we saw earlier. This also helped them lower costs to customers by producing with higher yield. They follow this belt to another demagnetizer, which holds each bearing assembly temporarily to ensure it isn't magnetic. Then an intense oil bath and ultrasonic cleaning stage ensues once more to ensure the bearing is prepped for the final stages. After this, there are eight more stages of washing for the bearings, this time progressing through a completely custom made machine for the job. You can see the bearings get moved one stage to the next by these black clamps. Each stage involves a spraying head that lowers down over the assembly, which blasts it with high pressure to fully clean out the channels. These tools then rotate the bearing assembly during the process to make sure it's fully clean. The nozzle then raises, the bearing is grabbed, physically moved to the next nozzle, and blasted again. It happens eight total times until it's ejected back onto a lift, where they progress up and over into the next machine. There's one last intermediary optical check, and then the bearings are dropped as if into a slot machine down this ramp. Like the world's lowest friction Plinko machine, this complex set of robotics performs a few steps. First, it checks the diameter once more and logs it. Then it performs a wash to remove some of the excess oil from earlier. Then it applies a special anti-corrosion formula, a lot of this not visible externally. And finally, it fills the bearing with grease and packs it together. The process is quick, at only a few seconds per bearing assembly. After all these steps, you can see the trays upon trays of bearings as they're sorted by size and type. And that shows the entire process of how the angular contact ball bearings are made. It's a lot of cleaning, conveyor belts, and optical inspection, with critical steps for grinding and polishing. But now, it's time to move on to the next stage. Next up, testing. We walked across the factory grounds and proceeded to the secure room where TPI's engineers do R&D and testing of their products. In this room, you'll see fans and petri dishes with bearings and oil everywhere, often accompanied by a pixel art smiling thermometer, indicating humidity and temperature and suffering. There are various types of environmental and thermal chambers here where TPI lets racks of new fans and exposed bearings sit in programmed conditions. This allows them to test for the impact of humidity and heat for longevity and endurance testing. Here, newly engineered fluid dynamic bearings are being sent through a drying oven at 120 degrees Celsius, with the company planning to move to 200 degrees in the future. Unfortunately for these bearings, their entire existence is to feel pain. They get made, and then they get tested until failure. Some of the endurance testing includes observing and occasionally sampling the oil in trays for chemical changes due to prolonged exposure to simulated elements. This is to double check that the oil's characteristics, such as viscosity and dry out endurance, are the same as in the CFD simulations. FDBs often use two different kinds of oil at different densities, so each of these is tested here. But in addition to product endurance testing, which is mostly done with rapid heating and cooling to simulate age at a faster rate, they also do real-time R&D testing. One of these ovens is used for research, and it'll be testing at 60 degrees Celsius for 100,000 hours. It's been running nearly continuously for years now, and it hasn't had a failure yet. Although this can be simulated to keep things practical, and it is, they still maintain some real-time ovens to check those simulations, even if it'll take a decade. For completed products, typically if anything fails, it'll be the electronics, the motor, or the circuit board. If a fluid dynamic bearing fails, it's normally from oil leakage or dry out. Now to get into FDB R&D and manufacturing, first some more basics. Fluid dynamic bearings are non-contact bearings that are typically quieter and steadier in operation as a result of their use of fluid. 
These get their name from the fluid in which the shaft rests, which, as it spins, pressurizes the fluid. FDBs are made of a few key components, the shaft, or the rotor, which is connected to the motor spindle, and the FDB inner surface is one of the key areas that gets designed. TPI machines its FDBs with a V groove, which is shaped just like it sounds. There's also the stator surrounding the shaft, commonly made of aluminum, brass, or bronze, or stainless steel. The fluid itself supports the load and, during rotation, forms a thin film between the shaft and the bearing housing. Grooves help to distribute this film evenly and at as low an RPM as possible. Finally, a return circulates the fluid and helps with heat dissipation. This room helps illustrate the components. The benchtop power supply, laptop, and test platform are configured for testing the voltage of the bearing to the fan shaft. As a demonstration, we see the voltage drop when the rotation stops or slows, which is due to friction or contact between the FDB and the shaft, especially in the resting state. By using voltage, this lab can evaluate the oil pressure within the FDB during operation, but without disturbing it. This R&D lab is trying to determine how the bearing behaves internally at different speeds, and so using these instruments gives it an inside look while preserving the integrity of the bearing. Now to the last leg of the tour, manufacturing of FDBs. While walking over to the FDB factory, we get a large reminder of just how many things have bearings. These spinning mini wind turbines are dotted around the campus, and for good reason. It's windy here. TPI makes the large bearings found in these power generating wind towers that help generate power for use within the campus. These also serve as R&D for TPI, as it can observe the longevity of its bearings on site. And now we're entering the FDB factory. Most of the steps are familiar to what we saw with ball bearings, which is why we went over them first. There's really only one key difference, and that's processing the metal and also filling it with fluid where they take a supply of metal rods and cut them down to size. We asked our community for some information on this machine since it was lost in translation, and viewer Calvino Bear wrote this. Quote, that's a bar feeder, probably for a Swiss type lathe or screw machine to make the bearings. It feeds bar stock into the lathe's cullet chuck while the chuck is unclamped, usually with some kind of pneumatic cylinder, into a stop in the machine. The lathe reclamps and then it can make a new part from this fed in material. It allows the machine to run almost completely unsupervised, making thousands of parts a day. And thanks to viewer Mr. Bear for that one. As the rod gets fed into the machine, it's chopped to size and spit out into a collection bucket. This eventually forms the housing that you can see in our completed FDB as we were allowed to take home as souvenirs. The rest of the FDB manufacturing steps are similar to the ball bearing steps. There's a lot of cleaning and conveyor in. And the secrecy around the fluid aspect meant we couldn't film that machine. After the bearings are completely manufactured, they go through desktop ultrasonic cleaners to remove debris once more, and then they get packaged in plastic and visually inspected. This room also serves as QC, where they take random samples and cut them in half to inspect the grooves. And that completes the bearing factory. This has been an incredibly educational journey into learning not just about how bearings are made, but how they work when different kinds are used. This has been our fourth weekly installment in our newest season of factory tours, Last week, we visited an engineering lab to learn about custom circuit board design for specialized tasks. Before that, we visited a RAM manufacturing and bidding facility. And before that one, a server and case manufacturing plant to kick this all off. Next week, we're taking a brief break from this series, and then we'll come back with a couple more episodes to close out the season. Subscribe to catch more of our educational factory tour series, and let us know what kinds of factories you want to see next. To support us and this educational series, go to store.gamersnexus.net and grab one of our brand new Disappointment Build 2023 shirts. We only made one run of these and we're already more than halfway through. We don't plan to restock them, so visit the store to pick one up today and support our series. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.